Um, what I'm going to be looking at today um, essentially are three case studies uh, of dematerialisation, reuse and efficiency um, where groups uh, didn't use life cycle thinking or life cycle assessment at the design stage uh, but they possibly could have to make some informed decisions. Uh, and then we're going to look at where LCA or life cycle assessment is sitting now uh, and possibly where it's going to be in the future as well in terms of product design. Uh, so this image we put up before um, with Usha's introduction. Uh, what, essentially what life cycle thinking is, you may, may or may not know, it's, it's looking at a product or service uh, through its entire life cycle from uh, the manufacturing and, and production through to a distribution system, um, a use and consumption stage and an end of life stage. And what life cycle assessment attempts to do uh, is to track the material or energy flows and waste streams or emissions uh, going through each part of that life cycle. Uh, so you're probably aware of things like carbon. It's quite a buzzword at the moment. It's quite an important metric. Uh, but there are a number of other metrics that we also use. And in my work um, with EcoCraze, I actually looked at um, five different metrics, um, which we'll have a look at when we go through the, uh, the examples and, and see sort of where the dynamics go with, with the particular products. So life cycle assessment can generally um, find within a product system where the major impacts are occurring um, for a particular product. So with a big electrical appliance, it might be in the use phase. It's using a lot of water and electricity. Maybe with a small appliance, it starts moving across to the production uh, or the materials embedded in, in, the, uh, in the product. With a static product, it might be not so much about the use, more about the production and, and the product stewardship schemes that are uh, introduced at the end. But design for environment has possibly missed the mark a bit in the past. So quite a, I suppose, famous example of, of touted eco-design is, is Philip Stark's television for Saba. And I'd, I'd probably argue that maybe instead of materials, he should have been concentrating on efficiency if you looked at a life cycle perspective. Another example, maybe the, the green shopping bags. So a good idea in principle, a good marketing mechanism maybe to get people involved in the green movement, but where do these actually end up? Do they really get used enough to actually pay back environmentally on a far more efficient, light plastic bag, or do they just end up after five years as being in the back of our pantries or in, in our cars? So it's an interesting sort of question to ask. LCA has traditionally been retrospective. It's costly, it's long-winded. But streamlined life cycle assessment using generic inventories and past studies, freely available data and models can be used for design decisions to verify and then verified later on with a full LCA. Similar to when, you know, I worked in commercial furniture and I designed tables and chairs, I'd do some very quick calculations to look at whether that, that product was strong enough. And then we'd test it later on with a far more expensive process to actually verify what was going on with that product and communicate that to the marketplace. The first study um, we worked on was with Cheviot Bridge, uh, which is a local wine manufacturer, um, who looked to move from a glass bottle to a Tetra Pak, or liquid paperboard packaging item. Um, they took their advice from Tetra Pak on the environmental credentials. They didn't really have much idea about what <laughs> those credentials meant in their context. What they could have done was a little bit of quick LCA work um, to verify whether the move was the right move for them. So what we did for them, we set up a model uh, of what occurred within that product system, uh, the packaging system. Uh, so we, we modelled the manufacturing all the way through to a sort of a consumption use phase and through to a disposal phase. An important point really was to look at um, what was going on when you had different recycling rates of the bottle and different recycled content for the bottle as well. Was that going to make a difference? Uh, on such a heavy item versus a lightweight item. Um, we put it on a uh, similar functional unit of one glass of wine served at the consumer's table. And these are the results that we, uh, we found for them. This one here, global warming, which is probably the most important metric these days. With a Tetra Pak that's got some recycle, recycling at the end based on some European data and different models of 
the glass bottle in terms of recycling rates and recycled content, and a new lean green bottle that you may be aware of that's come out with Owens, Illinois. But even apart from land use, which is slightly higher than global warming, pretty much all the metrics point to the fact that we probably shouldn't be using a glass bottle for these quick consumption items. You know, most wine in Australia is consumed very soon after purchase, apart from the high end. We actually then also pitted it against the actual product it was delivering. So the wine, there's a study on wine, manufacturing, a life cycle inventory, freely available. And in a number of metrics, global warming, water use, solid waste, the wine was still you know, on a better level than the, the packaging item that was actually you know, delivering the, the product. So it was, sort of, it was quite a compelling argument to use Tetra Pak instead of a wine bottle to deliver the product. And they had a quality product outcome in terms of more products delivered, lower price point, it was lighter, and it actually lasted longer. They tested in-house and dispelled rumours that glass bottles lasted longer. Their Sauvignon Blanc lasted longer in a Tetra Pak than it did in a glass bottle because of um, taint through the, um, the, the uh, bottle through uh, sunlight. But they still had to communicate that, that to the market and they found it quite hard. Um, could be argued maybe the communications weren't so good. Maybe the marketing strategy wasn't great around the product. They didn't push the environmental credentials enough. Maybe because they didn't know enough about it. Um, and they had to cut through that romance, longevity, quality aspects to a glass bottle. So there's, you know, there's a number of things at play that they had to deal with. The second study that we looked at was uh, a product you've probably been uh, aware of in Melbourne recently, which is the Keep Cup. This product derived from um, a sister-brother combination who um, commissioned a piece of design work out of a design studio in Melbourne. Uh, they ran a cafe and they saw a lot of waste going through that cafe. They had to deal with it, the customers had to deal with it, and that's, that was the sole reason they commissioned the study. They also got a few studies and pulled a few numbers out and used that for communications marketing. But they could have done some LCA research at the start and really got a feel for what all the metrics were, you know, were in terms of the product system that they were then designing. So again, two or three day model that we set up, something you can do on Excel. Uh, we didn't use Excel, but you can use Excel. And plugged in some numbers. Now the most important thing here is there's a paper cup, it's getting thrown away. It's not getting recycled in the waste stream. The keep cup, it's getting washed usually. So we had to model all that, different types of wash, washing of that cup to see whether that actually pushed it up compared to a disposable option. And we put it all on the level of one takeaway coffee cup, so one takeaway coffee per day delivered to the consumer over the period of a year. So that was the use profile. And we did it in two regions, in Australia and England, because they're starting to sell them in England as well. This was the disposable option in global warming on this side. As you have different wash types, so the quick bachelor's rinse, a couple of hundred mil of, uh, of water, all the way through to using a dishwasher half full and, sorry, uh, full and half full and a sink. This is Australia, this is England. So obviously Australia's got a worse energy grid, so it actually starts pushing it up towards or further up towards the disposal option, but it is a hell of a lot better than the disposable option still, even with a wash cycle. And across the other metrics, I mean, it's again a no-brainer. I mean, it, it's intuitive, but they were making claims based on sort of um, some fa fairly basic metrics that they'd pulled out of past research. Again, modelling the product itself against the packaging items or the, the delivery items, we found that the disposable option in most of the metrics, again, land use, water use, solid waste, a lot worse than the coffee itself. Um, cafes are starting to reduce their coffees for people who bring these products. So there's a payback after a very short period of time. So there is a, a financial benefit both to the, uh, the cafe and the consumer. And we've looked at past studies as well in terms of reuse and disposal. And the really important thing to come out of them is that the utilisation is really important. So if someone got this as a corporate gift and they used it four times, 
similar to those green shopping bags. The environmental benefit just is not uh, realised. So those behaviours and practices are really important and sometimes that is often outside the scope of the designer, which is something we're quite interested in at the centre. So what happens after it's, it's out in the real world? The final study we worked with Dyson. Um, Dyson are known obviously for uh, you know, some pretty innovative products. They do concentrate on efficiency with their electrical products and design these tiny digital motors compared to the existing brushed uh, carbon brushed motors. Again, the focus is good intuitively on efficiency, but they still have no embedded design uh, LCA methodology. Um, so they okayed us to go ahead with this, this work. Again, set up a system, set up a use phase as per um, some test methods, conservatively found um, that paper towels were two to four grams, so we went for a much more conservative end for that, that type of product. They're not recycled either, they go to landfill because they're a sanitary item. But some of them do have recycled content, which we also model. So the ability of the designer to uh, do sensitivity analysis, similar to the keep cut with the wash cycles, is there with these kind of models. Um, and we, all, we set it at a, a sort of a, a mid-level um, use phase of 200 pairs of hands over the five years of a, the life of a Dyson Airblade. For both products though, that was the um, functional unit. And again, some pretty co you know, compelling arguments here for a product that's highly efficient. Most of, I mean, the majority of this impact in the UK is from the use phase. The manufacturing really doesn't factor. It's just the electricity used over the five years. With this, it's the manufacturing and the materials within the paper towel. When you, when you start moving to two paper towels, I, went, well, I was in Germany a couple of weeks ago, I had to pull out four paper towels. It wouldn't let me get any less than four paper towels. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, you're starting to look way up, you know, off the scale in that kind of scenario. And all the other metrics, even worse, because we've got a, a product that's uh, from an agricultural background. We then modelled it in Australia versus the UK. Again, you can see the sensitivities where energy, energy grids change the game, but still the quantum's pretty compelling uh, for the air blade compared to the paper towels. The drop there in paper towels is recycling rates, so actually putting some recycled content into the, into the paper towels. You can still do that sensitivity. Again, the product has, has, has won a lot of accolades now in terms of the carbon trust work they've done. Um, economically, it stacks up in Australia based on paper towel costs. The air blade pays back in less than a year based on that load, so 200 pairs of hands per day over the year. Um, and Dyson are now looking at embedding this kind of process into their design process, so an LCA type methodology. LCA, like I said earlier, is traditionally retrospective. Potential environmental impacts, foundation of, of environmental claims, policy development, marketing, footprint calculations retrospectively. But where we really want to see, or, or do see it sort of moving, um, particularly in Europe, is this design tools and integration. So using it as a streamlined tool rather than this long-winded retrospective thing. That still needs to be done, but it also needs to be embedded at the start. So some tools are starting to be developed. Um, a couple there that we've developed. So Greenfly is one for product design. PK is another one for packaging, which Carl is going to um, take you through now. And we're starting to see it actually getting integrated into CAD packages as well. Um, so life cycle thinking tools. The really exciting bit, I think, um, for us, we alluded to it a little bit with the, um, the Keep Cup, with change of behaviours and practices. Um, CBSM and whole systems thinking and design thinking, um, using LCA to verify some of the design strategies and outcomes uh, that, that have come up with in these kind, of, uh, these kind of methodologies as well. Thanks for your time and I'll pass it on to Carly to go through PK.